Now, we've all seen the clip, and maybe this is a hot take, but I actually don't think Mike was mad they were singing like that. I really don't. I think he was disappointed. All right, welcome to Taste Take. If you're new here, today we're talking about the new Netflix documentary, The Greatest Night in Pop. If that's something you're into, hit that subscribe button for your boy. For my regular taste takers, let's find out why Prince wasn't there. Quick background here, The Greatest Night in Pop is a new Netflix documentary directed by Bao Wen that details the creation of one of the largest charity singles of all time, We Are the World. Bao is an Emmy-nominated Vietnamese-American filmmaker. He's done some other documentaries, I think one of the bigger ones is called Be Water. That's about Bruce Lee. That debuted at the Sundance Film Festival in 2020. The Greatest Night in Pop debuted at this year's Sundance and is available on Netflix right now. All right. Plot time. Like I said, The Greatest Night in Pop is about the creation of We Are the World, one of the biggest charitable songs, moments of all time. All right, so boom. I ain't even gonna lie. As much as I hate to say it, white people kind of started this. All right, all right, just relax. So in 1984, there's a group based out of the UK called Band-Aid. They record a song called Do They Know It's Christmas. This song was recorded to raise money and awareness for the famine in Ethiopia. Apparently, the BBC was one of the first news networks to report on this famine so that people could see what the hell was going on in Ethiopia. So all these British people are seeing this like, what the hell, this shit is crazy, we gotta donate. So now everybody's donating. Now the people who recorded the song Band-Aid is actually a collection of artists from all over that region that got together in one night to record the song. Kind of like, we are the world. Anyway, Harry Belafonte, actor, singer, activist, he catches wind of this. He's like, what the hell? We can't have these white people be the only people helping our people. We gotta get some of our own people to help our people. I mean, of course, it's not really like that, but he does believe strongly in the idea of black people in America stepping up. So he got an idea. So he's like, we gotta make an American song, anthem, whatever you wanna call it, to raise money for our people in Africa. So he hits up his boy, Ken Cragen. Ken Cragen has a bunch of musical connections. Fun fact, Ken Cragen is also the founder of Hands Across America, which took place like around the same time. You may remember Hands Across America from being old, or if you watched the movie Us. Anyway, Harry's like, Ken, hit your people up. We gotta make this song and save Africa. Ken's like, all right, all right, all right, relax. Let me call up my boys Lionel Richie and Kenny Rogers and see if they down. All right, they down. But I think we need a little bit more star power. Stevie? Stevie. But we also need a producer. Quincy? Quincy. Quincy's like, yeah, yeah, I'm in. But do y'all want me to call my other friend to see if he'll also be down? I don't know, that depends. Who's your friend? Did you hear what I said? The way it goes down. Call him right now. Mike said he's down to, now we got a party. The plan was to have Michael and Lionel writing the song while the team went out and recruited the other artists to be a part of it. The shit was like Ocean's Eleven. But how could you get all these people, the biggest stars in the world, in one place at one time? Insert the 1985 American Music Awards. Lionel Richie, of all people, is set to host the show and most of the stars that they need will also be in the building. It's perfect. We'll record it after the show. Which also like, bro, if I'm going to the American Music Awards and you want us to record the song after, does that mean that we can't like party and turn up after the show? Tate, it's for a good cause. Okay, okay, okay. Well, maybe like a little turn. Tate! All right, sheesh. Anyway, while all these artists were at the AMAs, Mike was in the studio doing his vocals and just getting shit ready. My man. Last thing about the AMAs though, I gotta go on a little tangent because it's just a little too wild for my 2024 brain to comprehend. That night, Lionel Richie won a lot of awards. And if you pay attention, you'll see the categories just are a little strange. And now, let's see what record will make it as favorite black single. Bitch, you better be joking. Yeah, they got like your favorite black song, your best black male, like, 
what in the tarnation? I don't know. Apparently, when Thriller came out, they were like, well, this ain't R&B or soul. It's really pop, but we can't give black people pop awards. So these brainiacs were like, let's just call them black. Listen, they went back to R&B and soul literally the next year. But just another example, when all these people out there be like, slavery was so long ago, you guys are fine. Like, it's the 80s. Anyway, and so it was. Over 40 of the biggest stars in music in one place at one time with no rehearsal together. How'd it turn out? Well, now we got a documentary. It was just a wish list. He said yes without knowing who was gonna be on it. Bob Dylan. Stevie Wonder. Paul Simon. Cindy Lauper. Pat Midler. Billy Joel. Steve Perry. Willie Nelson. I think we have Tina. Sheila E. Diana Ross. Everybody was there. So what's my take? Honestly, if you haven't already figured out that this YouTube channel is essentially a glorified Michael Jackson fan page, I don't know what to tell you. That said, I'm always very skeptical to see how the media will portray him since a lot of outlets seem to have a very strange propensity to dragging him down. But I'm a thousand percent pleased with how Balwin represented not only Michael, but all the other great black artists that came together to make this song. And of course, it's not just black artists. A large part of the magic of this record was the coming together of black and white artists alike. Some of them who probably never even met each other, like all for the greater good. Like that's the whole point of what music is supposed to do. When you watch this, one of the most important moments you'll see is how Quincy Jones made this handwritten sign at the entrance that said, check your ego at the door. And that's powerful stuff to trust that artists of their caliber would take heed to it. Yes, this is for charity. They should just chill out. But Hollywood is Hollywood. Anyway, back to the documentary. It just does such a nice job of telling the story and showing so much footage that I've never seen before. There's about a 90 million percent chance that I'll be watching this again. It's just so much happening. For example, there's a scene that I'm almost confident that the director didn't even think twice about that I rewinded three times. It's Diane Warwick sitting next to Lionel Richie, sitting next to Diana Ross, sitting next to Michael Jackson, and they all just chilling. Like what I wouldn't give to just hear what they were talking about in that moment. Then you got scenes like Lionel Richie in the studio with Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and Michael and Lionel are singing and performing the song for Stevie for the first time. Like it's on video. Also, did you know that Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder are like third cousins? Yeah, Stevie Wonder's mom and Michael Jackson's mom share a family. So, crazy. Anyway, yeah, such good footage. Michael Jackson's vocals, the group gathered around Stevie Wonder playing the piano, Bob Dylan, looking like he doesn't know where he's at. Which, at first, I'm looking at Bob like, bro, you too good for this? But then when you watch more, it's kind of just like, the moment was a little big and he felt maybe a little out of place. Imagine the imposter syndrome that people like in the regular world feel. But I'm sure there was a lot of that in the room and all the footage is there. And that kind of adds to some of the sadness of the whole thing. The documentary does a good job of including some of the people that were there in the film. Of course, Lionel Richie produced it, so you know he got whoever he can get to talk about it. And you got some of the behind the scenes guys, which was even cooler too. Lighting guys, sound guys, studio guys. And of course, some of the people involved since have passed away. But I just can't help but feel a level of sadness knowing that down the line, they'll all be gone. And every name that I knew growing up will just be a memory. Man, I can't be thinking like that. Some of the people that were involved are still here to tell us about the art that they made. I gotta think positive. All right, this thing in the documentary, but I gotta talk about it. Almost to the day of the 25th anniversary of the recording of We Are The World, in 2010, we saw another terrible tragedy, the earthquakes in Haiti. As if it was written in the stars. Naturally, the idea surfaces that they should recreate We Are The World to raise money and awareness for Haiti. Now, of course, this is a great gesture and it worked once, why can't it work again? Listen, when people say some things should be left alone, this is what they're talking about. Hey, I know we've been having a nice time together, talking about all the positive things that came from that recording, blacks and whites coming together, 
all for Africa. But you gotta look at this. No, no, no. There's more. Like Katrina, Africa, Indonesia, and now Haiti needs us. They need us. They need us. And how can I forget about White Clef? No someone That money is probably still in White Clef's bank account. Listen, listen. <laughs> this is serious. Okay, okay, okay. This is the last thing I'm gonna say about it, I promise. We Are the World 2 was so bad that Saturday Night Live made a skit where they recorded We Are the World 3 to raise awareness for the disaster that was We Are the World 2. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta just leave it alone. Bless their hearts though. Back to the original. Since its release in 1985, We Are the World has raised over $63 million for humanitarian causes. That's over $168 million in today dollars. 90% of that money was pledged to African relief, both short and long term, and the other 10% was pledged for domestic use, trying to fight our hunger and our homelessness right here in the US. Which I can appreciate because a lot of the times we'd be giving aid out to other countries and they'd be needing it, but sometimes we'd be needing it too. And they'd be needing it more, but we'd be needing it too. But they'd be needing it more. But still, we are not in famine. It is estimated that that same 1983 to 1985 famine I talked about in Ethiopia killed up to 1.2 million people because they were hungry. Charity can be tricky. You're donating money, but you're not always exactly sure where it's going to end up, especially if you give it to Wyclef. But in June of 1985, the first USA for Africa cargo jet landed in Ethiopia and Sudan with food, clothing, and medicine. And Harry Belafonte flew over to Africa not long after to see it for himself. Now, even though things are much better than they were, I wish I could say we solved the hunger problem in Ethiopia. But even as recent as an October 2023 report, the World Food Program listed Ethiopia as having over 20 million people in need of emergency food assistance. And a lot of this is a result of conflict, displacement, climate change, even COVID. It's not great, but organizations like the World Food Program are doing what they can to help out. And as can be expected, if you want more information, you can check the description of this video because I got their link if you want to help out, donate, or just learn more. And you can't trust all these charities and organizations, but this is backed by the UN and they are reviewed very highly as people doing charity work the right way. But back to my original point, there is hard evidence that We Are The World made a serious impact on the people in Ethiopia. I found this excerpt online. Following Michael Jackson's death in 2009, Elias Kiffel Miriam Bien, who grew up in Ethiopia and was a beneficiary of the aid provided by the single said, I won't ever forget Michael Jackson because his contribution to the song We Are The World had a very significant effect on my life. I am 50 now, but 25 years ago, I was living in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, which at that time was suffering from a long drought and famine. It was a terrible situation. Lots of people became sick and many more died. Around 1 million people in all were killed by the famine. In 1984, Michael Jackson, along with a number of other leading musicians, made the song We Are The World to raise money for Africa. We received a lot of aid from the world, and I was one of those who directly benefited from it. The wheat flour that was distributed to the famine victims was different to the usual cereal we bought at the market. We baked a special bread from it. The local people named the bread after the great artist and it became known as Michael Bread. It was soft and delicious. When you have been through such hard times, you never forget events like this. If you speak to anyone who was in Addis Ababa at that time, they all will know what Michael Bread is and I know I'll remember it for the rest of my life. I'm gonna give the greatest night in pop five stars. It's so incredibly well done. And even though the 80s wasn't that long ago, it's incredibly impressive how much footage they have to make us feel like we're in the studio with them recording this. Seeing how Quincy Jones was the glue of it all, knowing the best people in music to make the song a hit, from who sings what part, all the way down to who stands next to who, is genius. Then Lionel Richie. I know I explained that Lionel and Michael wrote the song together, but it's been explained through other collaborators that Michael did most of the writing and never felt the need to explain that part. But what Lionel may have lacked in writing this song, he made up for by being the absolute 
force in the studio. Imagine how impossible it would be to gather the attention of a room like that. You know the expression, herding the cats? This is herding tigers. The doc shows Lionel navigating the space, putting out fires before they even become fires, just keeping the energy up at all times. That's not something that Michael could do. Listen, the last thing I say before I get out of here is really just an apology. And this apology is to Kenny Loggins, Steve Perry, and Daryl Hall. I'm sorry I wasn't familiar with your game. Can we get a clip in? We all want to make a brighter day, so let's start giving. Nah, but do, my, do, but do my part right here. This, this is my part. Do my part. Do my part. Do my part. All right, and then bring us home. Boy, listen, just go watch the documentary. It's out now. You already got Netflix and the shit is fire. Sheesh. As always, thanks for checking out Taste Take. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit that like and that subscribe button. In the comments, please tell me you're planning on checking this out. If you do, let me know your favorite part. Did you know this story of We Are The World? Have you heard the song We Are The World? It, uh, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, just because now people are just, they won't be watching the video all the way to the end. But if anyone's here, they're just here. I almost cried at the end. That's the type of time I'm on. Ah. Thanks for the time, y'all. Peace. Oh, uh, Prince. So, listen. They asked Prince to be a part of this thing. And he was being Prince. So he's like, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Prince is at the damn AMAs, winning awards and all this. They're like, yo, are you going to come be a part of this? He's like, I'll call you back or whatever. Yeah. The story goes that he demanded to have a guitar solo, but he would have to record that in a separate room from anyone else. Stop being weird, Prince. Silver Lining, he submitted a single to be on the We Are The World album, so like, cool, you, you did your part, but why you want to be in the room where it happens? Hmm? You think you don't want to be around people? You think Michael Jackson wants to be in a room full of those people? He don't do none of that stuff. But it's for the greater good, man. Legend has it is that they picked Sheila E to be on the song as a gateway to get Prince. Never got Prince. <laughs>